So first of all, my name is Dr. Lauren Seiler. I am a postdoctoral investigator at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Uh, I study carbon assimilation strategies in the deep ocean and in the subsurface and terrestrial and marine environments. Uh, I'm a first generation PhD. Uh, I'm bisexual and I'm a new mom. <laughs> There's my daughter, Eleanor, and her daddy, Keith. Um, so we're very excited to be here. This is my first conference back after giving birth and it's been a trip. Uh, so the name of this panel is Allies and Advocates in Astrobiology, a discussion on diversity and inclusivity. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what we mean by some of these terms. What is the difference between an ally and an advocate? What is the difference between diversity and inclusivity? Um, and Jen made a very good suggestion, and that is that it really should be aspiring allies and advocates because all of us, including myself and everyone on this panel, is really working towards becoming a better ally and a better advocate for underrepresented groups. Um, and before we get started, I want to thank Melissa Kirvin Brooks for all of her support in helping get this panel off the ground, and also Danielle Scalise. Just, there's just been so much support from NASA when I first approached them about this idea, and they were very, very excited about having this panel, so I couldn't have done it without their encouragement. Um, but another uh, impetus for this panel, apart from the need for discussing this topic, is also to shamelessly plug an upcoming workshop slash conference. I don't think we've really decided exactly how to frame it yet, called WTF Astrobiology, <laughs> which of course stands for Women, Trans, and Femmes in Astrobiology. So that will be coming up in uh, early 2020, winter, spring. Um, it will be hosted at Arizona State University by Sarah Walker and Teresa Fisher. And uh, we're very, very excited about that. It's looking like it's going to be about a three day long conference, kind of small, kind of intimate. We'll be talking about gender issues in astrobiology and we'll be highlighting the work of women, trans and femmes uh, astrobiologists. Although men are also welcome to attend. Uh, and we will be discussing uh, the parameters of that later on. But if you're at all interested in helping out with this workshop in any way, um, or if you just have more questions about it, this is my contact information. Uh, and you can also hit me up on Twitter at Muscomer. And there's a QR code here, and I wanna see everybody take out their phones, take a picture of the QR code, because that is a survey uh, on the upcoming workshop uh, asking what kind of things would you like to see discussed? Uh, what are your experiences in discrimination in astrobiology? And if you've been to a panel or a workshop like this before, what did you think of it? What did you like? What did you dislike? Uh, so we can get an idea of what the community wants and needs out of a workshop like this. I see a lot of phones out. Good job. You guys are good at taking direction. All right, so before we get started, I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, we'll start down the end. That is Dr. Kenda Lynch. She is a staff scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. She's a geomicrobiologist, and she also studies uh, planetary habitability and works on the development of in situ instruments for robotic exploration. Um, to her right, that's Dr. Jen Glass. I had to look to make sure <laughs> it was Dr. Jennifer Glass. She is a recently tenured associate professor. Yes, at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And she is a microbial ecologist and a guru of methane cycling and all things methane cycling. Um, to her right, Dr. Sean Domigal Goldman, who is a research scientist at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, he studies isotope fractionation and spectroscopy based technologies for exoplanet habitability. To his right, we have Teresa Fisher. She's a doctoral candidate at Arizona State University. Uh, and she studies chemical reaction networks that may serve as biosignatures in exoplanet atmospheres. And finally, we have Dr. Joan Schmelz. 
Uh, she is the Stratosphere Observatory for Infrared Astronomy Associate Director for Science and Public Outreach at NASA Ames, and she is the former chair of the American Astronomical Society's Committee on the Status of Women in Astrobiology. So I'm going to turn things over to Joan, and she's going to open up this topic with some work that she has done about specifically sexual harassment and how to become a better advocate uh, for when you see harassment in the workplace. So I, I guess I have to start out with a confession. I'm not an astrobiologist, I'm an, I, but I am an astronomer. So it was the Committee on the Status of Women in Astronomy, and it's a, committee, a standing committee of the American Astronomical Society. So this is my first astrobiology conference. I'm here as part of the NASA postdoctoral program. And I have learned that Mel Melissa is the ultimate networker. So if you want to know about net networking, definitely uh, follow in her wake, because she was the one who heard about my uh, talk on allies and advocates and, and put it together with this one on the day when the NASA postdocs were actually meeting at lunchtime to, to have a town hall on, for astrobiology. So well done, Melissa. We all have a f um, some lessons to learn about networking from you. And this um, is a segment that was uh, of a talk that I give on sexual harassment, but it came, um, it was born from the, uh, a, a column that I wrote for the NASA postdoctoral program uh, newsletter. And when the the editor asked if, um, if I would write something as part of the director's corner. So I actually got a promotion recently, um, so it, uh, it's, it's not surprising. So I'm the new director. I'm not an associate director anymore. Um, that I, I asked if I could write about something I cared about. And they said, sure, of course you can. Um, and it turned out that for the first time, I had been thinking about this for a very long time and finally sat down and wrote out um, this column, and that is what this little segment um, was born from. So creating allies and advocates, how do we do that? And for, for me as an astronomer, um, I, I was the chair of this committee on the status of women in astronomy a number of years ago when there were multiple high-profile stories about sexual harassment that made the news, made the news big time. And you can see there's a cluster of them in astronomy. And I was going to tell you, I was going to begin with a little story, a once upon a time type story, about what, how I was involved and why I was involved in, um, in the background in these cases. So it, um, it started uh, in 2011 when I decided to blog uh, for the Women in Astronomy blog about my own experience with sexual harassment. It was uh, um, a decision that involved dredging up very painful memories. It involved um, a real um, fear of retaliation. And it involved conversations with lawyers to make sure that I was allowed to publish under my own name and not anonymously. So this uh, blog was posted, um, and it had a completely unexpected and unintended consequence. That women, uh, usually graduate students um, from across, but not, in, but not universally, from across the country, um, began contacting me with their own stories. They were reaching out for help. They were contacting me. I was a complete stranger. I'd never met them and they desperately needed to be able to talk, talk to someone about their own experiences and their own stories. And it was uh, all this time trying to provide as much support as I could, trying to contact or put them in contact with someone locally who could help them. A couple years went by and I realized that I had talked to several women who had been harassed by the same harasser. They didn't know about each other. They didn't know that they had, um, had been um, essentially the victim 
of this person that I came to think of as a serial harasser, a real predator. And I'm sitting there wondering, what can I do? How can I help? These stories were not mine to share. They were private. And fortunately, to try and understand how to deal with this dilemma, I had help from members of the committee who um, were able to bounce ideas off of each other in what I considered to be um, a safe space. And what we decided to do, what I just finally decided to do, was ask each of these women individually if your harasser had harassed someone else, would you want to know about it? And several of them said yes, and, they wanted, they, and several of them decided to talk to each other. And as a result of that, four of them filed Title IX complaints with their university. And they, they came to realize that none of them had a special relationship, and I use air quotes with that phrase, with the harasser. And the only way that they knew that was because these other women had, been, had, had very similar experiences. So they, uh, they filed Title IX complaints. The university found him responsible. And they punished him with what we all described as a mere slap on the wrists. The complainants decided to go to the press and BuzzFeed published their story in October 2015. And suddenly, everyone in astronomy was talking about the sexual harassment problem. So I decided that even though I wasn't one of the complainants, I was just behind the scenes, that I would talk to the press on the record and part of the reason was because, to take the heat off of the complainants, that several of them wanted to remain anonymous, and as far as I know, their names have never gotten out. And one of the things that I said that is that we have to sh find a way to shift the, the burden, a way to change the system, to take the pressure off the young women in the most vulnerable stages of their careers, to shift it to senior men many of whom admitted to knowing the open secret for years, if not decades. So the cartoon, the little picture is worth looking at. For whatever reason, several senior men in astronomy told me about why they never intervened, that they knew about what was going on but they never stepped up. And I don't know if it was a confession or, or what, but multiple people said to me things like, it was none of my business, I didn't want to interfere, I didn't know what to do, I thought I might make it worse, it wasn't my problem, boys will be boys. And that's an incomplete list. And rather than be mad at them. I was sort of mad at them, but rather to channel that anger into something positive, what I decided to do is to take them seriously, that they really didn't know what to do. And how could I help them become better, become aware of what they should do? How could you take these men that were standing, these senior men with a with lot of power, with a lot of privilege, and turn them from bystanders to allies and advocates. So for those who turned a blind eye, how do we make them aware of the damage that was being done by this very prestigious colleague? For those who knew what was going on, but who felt powerless to get off the sidelines, how do we provide them with the means to make a difference? How do we turn bystanders into allies and allies into advocates? And this is exactly the thing that Melissa realized would, would be the perfect segue in, into, this, um, into this session. And 
Bystander training has become a very hot topic. We've certainly been talking about it at the American Astronomical Society um, in the wake of the Me Too movement. So the, 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 very, the thing that I wrote was something that I eventually called the advocacy axis. And this is a picture um, of, the, of the axis. So what are the components of this axis? And these are the labels. And in this case, we're going to use the example of something not as complex as sexual harassment, but as simple and as common as a sexist joke told in a professional setting. So the idea is that the pro protagonist tells the joke, the participant laughs, the bystander does nothing, the ally pushes back, and the advocate changes the culture. So in the example of the sexist joke, which I'm sure that many of us have been in professional situations where we have heard something like this, what do you do? So my take is that if we all took one step in the right direction along this advocacy axis, we could make the world a better place. So the protagonist, that's the person who tells the joke. Don't tell the joke. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a simple thing. It's become, it's, it's like step up, become a better person. It's never appropriate to make insulting or condescending remarks about women or as, as a group. And you can substitute women for many, many different phrases that are all related um, to the, the purpose of the session. So for the protagonist, you don't have to go all the way to advocate. Just take a step in the right direction. Do the right thing. Say, I'm not going to tell that joke anymore or I'm not going to tell the joke. So for the participant, don't laugh. You know, if you can't help yourself, walk away. Like, it's really never appropriate. A joke at someone else's expense is it shouldn't be funny. It doesn't matter if it's a sexist joke or a racist joke or any other kind of joke. It's just not appropriate. So. If you can't go all the way to ally or advocate, at least become a bystander and don't do the inappropriate thing. Don't encourage the bad behavior. So the bystanders, uh, I mean, I, I, you'll see in just a little bit where I've been a bystander and really wished I could have stepped out but didn't quite know how. But the bystander is the one standing there thinking, I wish I had a really quirky comeback. You know, I just don't. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. This makes me uncomfortable. I, I cringe when this the kind of thing happens. It's almost like you have to have a phrase in your back pocket that you can pull out in circumstances like this because you, you don't have enough time to think of something clever. And one of the phrases that works in a situation like this is, I disagree. It changes the whole dynamic. It, stops everybody in their tracks. They, they take a moment to think about exactly what they're doing. Now, when you step off that bystander place and move to the, the position of an ally, you have to be prepared for feedback. It could be negative feedback. The, the protagonist could push back against you. You might not be part of the in crowd if your in crowd is the, is the crowd that tells sexist jokes. But on the other hand, you could create an, uh, a situation where the other people who didn't know what to do or what to say could push back and join with you and say, yeah, it's really not appropriate to, sell, to tell sexist jokes in a professional setting. So that one little phrase, I disagree, is something you can pull out of your back pocket in a circumstances like, circumstance like this and you don't have to imagine or create uh, something clever to say for every situation, because a lot of times we don't have time to do that. So if you're already an ally, you could, do so you could step up. You could join uh, a diversity and inclusion committee. 
Like every university have to, has them, every NASA center has them, um, every organization, like the American uh, the American uh, the uh, the American Astronomical Society or the AGU, they all have these organizations. So invest the time to um, for, to join um, and become an ally or become an advocate. And the one thing that you really need to do is practice. So it's not like we're going to immediately change the world and eliminate very complex problems like sexual harassment or workplace bullying or assault. But let's start with something simple. Here's another example, something that's not the sexist joke. You could consider it a microaggression. So a session chair at a professional meeting. So here we are, we're at a professional meeting. Many of you have been session chairs or will be session chairs in the next week. Calls for the last question. Two hands go up. One, a senior male, trying to be polite, says, ladies first, and defers to the other questioner. What do you do? So. Uh, this happened to me about a year ago. I was in the audience. This is a case where I was a bystander. I cringed when he said this. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I, a year later, I'm still thinking, what should I have done? What should I have said as a bystander? So you can think about, what would you do if you're the session chair and the senior male immediately took your responsibility of calling for the question? What could you do as the woman who was deferred to? What could you do as a member of the audience like I was, who, um, who cringed at this? And, and then you could think about um, also, how many people in the audience thought that there was anything wrong with this statement? And do you have to explain why it's wrong to do that? why it was wrong on his part, the senior, uh, senior man, um, to do this. We can come back to that if you need to. So that's a mic an example of a microaggression. Here's an example of a stereotype. Um, a woman seeking a promotion is often lauded for, by management for her understanding, teamwork, diplomacy, and service. Well, Suppose she's coming up for tenure in a research intensive environment. None of these things are going to really play to her strengths. They're not going to be part of her tenure decision. So what do you do in that case? If you're her department chair, if you're her colleague, if you're her, what do you do? And what if the woman involved doesn't display any of these characteristics, like they don't that a woman doesn't conform to the normal stereotype of being nurturing, what happens then? And then, this is one I just learned about um, this past week. A professor returning from maternity leave is asked to teach an overload to make up for the missed classes. It's like, this is a real discrimination case. Maternity leave doesn't mean that you do all the work after you get back, right? So if you're a member of this uh, woman's department, or if you're her department chair, or if that you're the dean, like, what do you do? How do you support a woman in this position that isn't, should never be confronted with this kind of question? All right, so just in, in closing, we all want to work in an environment where everyone can do their best work. So addressing issues like harassment and discrimination, microaggressions, unconscious bias, stereotypes, improves the climate for all of us. So it all starts with you. Let's work together to make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan. That was amazing. Um, okay, so moving on from that 
really great opener kind of introducing this topic. I would like to have each of our panelists talk a little bit about their own backgrounds and their own uh, experiences with discrimination within astrobiology in particular and STEM in general, and also their experiences uh, mentoring uh, members of underrepresented groups. So uh, do you want to pass the microphone down? Uh, okay. Yeah, let's start with, oh yeah, well, okay, we'll start with Tessa and move, and move to the left. Hi, so uh, like Lauren said earlier, my name is Tessa Fisher, and I'm a PhD candidate at ASU, working on exoplanet biosignatures. I am also, so far to the best of my knowledge, probably the world's only openly trans lesbian astrobiologist, um, which has given me, oh, thank you. Um, a pretty unique perspective going through academia, especially since I transitioned right at the point where I finished my master's and started my PhD. Um, so I kind of like, I had enough of a career back when I was perceived as male to like get a sense of what that's like and then to be able to contrast that to how I'm treated and perceived now. Um, I have been very, very fortunate in that the astrobiology community has been extraordinarily welcoming. Like, literally, within hours of me coming out and you know posting it on social media, like my colleagues in astrobiology were some of the first people to switch names and pronouns just completely fluidly. Um, didn't have to ask them or anything. It just happened, and all of a sudden I was getting emails addressed to Tessa. Like it was no big deal, and it was lovely. Um, and I've also been very, very blessed in that. Um, unlike a lot of trans people in this country, I've been very privileged. I've been completely accepted and supported by my family and by my, by my partner and by my institution. Um, Arizona State is noteworthy in that its graduate student healthcare is fully trans inclusive, which is not common everywhere and is very unfortunate because being trans is really expensive, at least from a medical point of view. Um, and admittedly, while that wasn't the sole factor in me deciding what university I went to, it definitely played a role, knowing that, for example, that the insurance would cover surgery for me, which it did. It saved me $20,000. So um, uh, thanks for the vagina, ASU. Um, <laughs> but with all that said, it hasn't always been easy. Um, while I, again, have been very fortunate, my wife, well, then fiance, now wife, who was going through veterinary school at the time that I came out, was subjected to a fair amount of harassment um, simply because she was still partnered with me. We discovered that some of her colleagues in the veterinary teaching hospital break room were having these long and involved discussions involving a lot of gross speculation, both about the nature of my anatomy and our sex life. Um, and furthermore, when we brought this up and to the university, this wasn't at ASU, this was a previous institution, um, to the university's equal opportunity office, they did an investigation, but none of the bystanders or witnesses were willing to come forward, so nothing ever came of it. Um, and honestly, that have, was one of the things that eventually led to her deciding to leave veterinary medicine. I mean, there was other stuff involved, but that was a major factor. Um, so, you know, the discrimination LGBT people experience in general is still very real, even in this day and age. Um, and even though astrobiology has been really good about it, at least from my admittedly limited experience, it's still an issue. And even for a more subtle level, just in terms of visibility, one of the things I've loved about this conference is that um, they gave out the rainbow fence. I've been at previous conferences where I had no idea if I was the only person there who wasn't both cisgender and heterosexual because no one ever talks about it. Whereas I get here and I'm like seeing the rainbow fins everywhere and I'm like, yes, we are legion. <laughs> um, but you know, I th it is, can be really alienating. Um, to walk into a room and wonder if you're the only person there who's like you. Um, so, I mean, as progressive as astrobiology has been in my experience, we still are getting there. We still have a ways to go. So, 
I'm Sean Domical Goldman. I'm at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, I have a lot of privilege in my life, and I have not been discriminated against uh, in my professional life. Um, I am keenly aware of a lot of discrimination that I'm surrounded by, um, especially now that I'm coming into leadership roles at the mission level, the research level. We've got a research team that, that we have made intentionally diverse. Um, and now I'm a branch chief um, in the management line. So now I'm doing things for like, I'm kind of like the, a department chair, the equivalent at NASA. Um, so that means I'm doing performance reviews of 16 people. I'm in hiring and firing decisions. Um, and I'm seeing on both the day-to-day -day and on those longer term scales, um, discrimination in the workplace. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm at that transition in my career between um, seeing a lot of this stuff going on and now having the power and the responsibility to make that change. Um, and so those are the things I'll be talking about today. Great. Hi, I'm Jen Glass, um, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, as Lauren said, I'm um, at Georgia Tech, and I've learned a lot being in Atlanta. I think previously, um, I was definitely more on the white feminist side. Um, I did not understand how my own privilege at all about really how my own privilege as a white person um, and as a white feminist. And I think um, being in Atlanta is really, and being on Twitter and then starting to educate uh, my, myself and find ways of getting educated and not, not, and trying to educate myself as opposed to, you know, thinking that um, underrepresented groups had to, educate me. There's a lot of good books out there and a lot of Google out there, so I've learned a lot that way. I think um, I also, um, something I've done in this community is I got kind of, as some of you may know, got a little annoyed a few years ago when, for, after hearing for the fifth time an Origin of Life talk that was all, all white men, uh, I decided to make a slide that had every single, <laughs> you know, uh, woman I could think of in Origin of Life, and I'm glad to see that that's been going around. And I'm I need to make a version three because I know it's missing a lot of people, including um, you know new members of the community, which is so exciting to see. Um, and I've been outspoken, uh, some of you know, on Twitter when. Um, you know, members of that community are not invited. <laughs> so I've called out some pretty senior uh, dudes in the field, and they've been pissed off, and that's how things change, especially now that I get, now I've got tenure, so I can be even louder. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little sick, so I'm probably going to cough every once in a while. I'm Kendall Lynch. I'm at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, and like uh, tr um, Teresa, I um, uh, um, I often have to go to conferences, and I don't have to wonder because it's kind of very apparent when I'm the only one in the room. So, but I've had that experience of of wondering when it, when is that going to change? When am I when am I not going to be the only one in the room? I have also been very fortunate in the um, in my time in the astrobiology community that when I was presented with challenges um, as a graduate student um, with respect to uh, diversity and discrimination issues, it was members of the astrobiology community that stepped up to be my advocates and allies to help me deal with the issue. So I've, I've dealt with a lot of issues over the course of my, my time in my training and up till now, but it was always members of the astrobiology community that always stepped up to to kind of advocate and um, help me through that. So I'll be talking a lot about that today. And one other small area that I would like to kind of address here that can be another issue, um, I'm also a survivor of um, domestic violence um, and domestic abuse. And I think it's something that, in addition to sexual harassment in the workplace, it's also something that affects a lot more women and men than we know, and women and men in um, in educated in educated high level positions like all of us are in. It's you know there's a stigma that domestic violence only happens to a certain type of person, and that's not true. Um, my now ex husband was a medical doctor and was abusive, and I've started to learn through the process of escaping that that situation and healing that you know the you know. 
all of a sudden, all the stories of women, lawyers, IT professionals, other medical doctors, um, other scientists that had the same experience. So I think it's also something that we need to talk about and we need to advocate and ally um, and support the members of our community with because it's something that's even more insidious and more difficult to talk about because it happens behind closed doors at home and we really need to start being there for our, those people and try to, to help and support them when we see or suspect something is going on. So I'll talk a little bit more about that today. Great. Okay, so I'm going to start opening up the panel to some questions. Uh, I'm going to lead with a question just to kind of get the conversation going, and then I would like to invite all of you to ask questions. You can um, ask specific panel members, um, or you can open up a question to the entire panel. Um, but the question that I have for the panel is, what do you think marks the difference between uh, diversity and inclusivity? What makes something diverse versus inclusive? That's the one. <laughs> Musical microphones. They, 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 they all look the same, right? <laughs> um, so I am senior enough in the field of astronomy to remember when we were talking about diversity and not adding inclusion. So I will tell you that I will confess open, openly here that I had to think um, very seriously about what that meant. What, what was it that made us go from thinking about diversity to diversity and inclusion. And diversity for, for me was, say, if you have a, um, a university department and they want to hire a diverse set of new assistant professors. And if that set of assistant professors comes into an environment that's exactly the same as it had been for the past 20 years, it's going to be very difficult for them to thrive in that environment. Where inclusion is where the department itself changes and adjusts and looks at its own prejudices and stereotypes and changes as a result of the fact that they want to be a, a better environment, that they want to welcome a more diverse um, set of new, new assistant professors, that they want to be inclusive. So inclusion is what we do as an institution to, to change the environment that we've had for many, many years. And diversity is bringing people in from all walks of life and creating and, and inclusion is creating the environment where they can all thrive. Uh, sort of to echo what uh, Joan said, I'm very much of a similar opinion that diversity is more of a measure of demographics, um, and it, that's still important. But inclusion really is talking about the actual culture, the actual mindset of the institution or the environment or whatever it, it you know group of people that you're examining that you know you can have extremely diverse environments and they're not inclusive because the overall culture still only focuses on one particular class or type of pe person and kind of just speak to lesser degree begrudgingly tolerates everybody else um, and I think that that's why sort of the gradual shift we've had in attitudes going from just talking about diversity to talking about inclusion has been so, so important. Uh, totally agree. I, I, I think as in a management role, the thing I've been trying to figure out is how do you do both of those when um, without one, it's really hard to do the other. Um, if you don't have the inclusivity, you're not going to retain any diversity that you recruit to your department or your institution. Um, on the other hand, more diverse environments tend to be more inclusive. Um, and so trying to work on both of those uh, axes at the same time is something I've been trying to pay a lot of attention to and I know is a, is, is a, is a challenge. 
Great. I'll add on also, um, I think inclusivity um, is empowering. It's also creating um, a culture that empowers um, its diverse membership uh, to pursue, uh, you know, positions of leadership. Um, and then you start to see that the, um, that the demographics at the, you know, higher up on the ladder are changing. And so I think that's a good, um, something, you know, um, something to really keep an eye on because if it's only, you know, I think students probably tend to be more diverse, right? And a, um, an institution can say, oh, look how diverse our student population is. Everything's great. But until you have role models that look like those students, I don't think it's really going to change much. It's going to take an incredibly long time. So I, I agree with everything that's just been said. But I'd also like to add an element of inclusion also is understanding. You know, yes, you can have lots of diversity, but inclusion, even when you have lots of diversity, doesn't always follow. I'll give you an example in my workplace and in college life where I, I was lucky to be in very diverse, you know, um, environments where there was actually a lot of black professionals. So there were, you know, we had a very diverse work and school environment, but when activities happen, the black professionals did their activities and the white professionals did their activities. And there was no inclusivity across line. And a lot of it that I discovered is that the black professionals felt that the white professionals didn't understand them enough so they couldn't be themselves outside of professional time because they were worried about the inherent biases that would come up if they could actually let their hair down and be themselves. So for me, inclusivity is kind of breaking that line and having that dialogue of understanding, you know, what what their what their comfort zone is and how they like to be when they're not working and w when they're kind of in their space, like understanding their space, understand their comfort zone, and being able to step into their world and be comfortable in it, and then you know then you can really have inclusiveness. And so, in the context of grad school, it's basically making sure that you understand your diverse students, making sure you understand what their perspective and their experience and their background is and making sure that when you create activities for your students or your lab or your group, that you have that in mind when you create that activity so you do something that is inclusive for their experience. So that's something that I think is important. I like all those answers. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'd like to open things up to the audience. So there's a microphone up here. If you have a question, uh, come on up. Uh, we can form a line, I guess, behind the microphone. So it's, it's the race to the microphone. <laughs> um, I'd just like to add something to that distinction between diversity and inclusion. I think that I come from a very diverse, oh, I'm Dawn Sumner uh, in Earth and Planetary Science, UC Davis. I come from uh, the most diverse Earth Science Research Department in the country. And a lot of it reason it is diverse is because there were people dedicated to inclusivity before the diversity emerged, mm -hmm. right? And so I would like to challenge all of us who are in roles of leadership that we can start those conversations about inclusivity even when we lack the diversity. And one of the reasons that my department has been able to maintain diversity is because we place that inclusivity at a, at a high level. And right now, we're, my department's under a little bit of threat due to various circumstances, and the number of faculty are going way down. And one of, the, one of the things that we're working on is how do we actually convince our university administration that we should actually be invested in because we can meet those goals. We know we have the environment to meet those goals for, for an inclusive department. And that leads, that leads to the diversity. So I, I really like that question you started with, with the inclusivity, because that's, that's what allows people to thrive. Mm. Even white men thrive better in an inclusive environment, even white straight men, right? It's better <coughs> for everyone except the few people who get their power from exclusion. Um, my name is Mache Aaron. I'm a second year PhD student at Johns Hopkins studying planetary science. Um, something that I've noticed throughout my years of being in what I do, um, 
I, I'm, I'm always by myself. Like, I'm the only black girl in a group. And there will be other minorities, but they wouldn't be re underrepresented of minorities. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed also is, like, so I ha I'm from the South. I'm from Texas, so I have an accent. And I've actually had white colleagues get on me on how I say um, the names of certain instruments or certain chemicals or, or minerals. And I, I can't help it. That's just how I talk. So I was just wondering, how do y'all handle situations like that where you're by yourself and you encounter someone that basically just makes fun of how you say your science? Mm. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know, I mean, um, as far as, as, as far as like how I speak, it's, I've kind of had the opposite where I've been told I talk too white. <laughs> um, so I, I basically kind of, I tend to use humor to deal with those things, so I kind of turn it on them and, and use humor in some way, shape, or form. As far as being the only chocolate drop in the room, yes, that's a real problem. And I've experienced it all through, um, <clears throat> uh, through most of my, uh, of my graduate school time. What I can tell you is, is that um, some of the things that we're doing to deal with that is that we are developing a network to communicate with each other, to, to connect all of our minority, especially our, our uh, scientists of color, and trying to encourage them all to try to share and find each other at meetings so that we can start to increase the diversity in these rooms. Like, I've seen a lot more diversity at this meeting, and it's been great. It's, it's been like probably the last two or three abscicons have been where I have not been the only one. <laughs> and it's been really exciting. So as far as, as far as how you handle it when you are the only one, um, you, um, I pretty much, it, how I handle it was, I, I pretty much just, um, you know, so I just decided it was an opportunity to uh, to make a difference and change it. So I mean, think that's pretty much kind of how I handled it. It was frustrating, and I would usually make comments to to the meeting organizers or to this, you know, the session or the workshop organizers, and I'd go and try to find out, like, well, where are our diverse, you know, students? What's going on? What are the demographics? So basically, I used it as an opportunity to get in and participate and, and make and, and encourage change. And by the way, that's the thing we all should be doing, mm -hmm. right? Like, that shouldn't be on you, yeah. right? Like, that, that's, that, and that's what being a, a, an advocate and moving into that space is all about. So if, ideally, like for all the other senior folks in the room, like you should be making it more comfortable so that you know people don't have to think about code switching or whatnot, and and can choose what they want to do in that space. Well, I was gonna say, and as far as somebody making fun of how you talk, I would just flat out say that's not appropriate. Yeah. I mean, don't don't hold any punches. It's not appropriate, and I don't appreciate it. And and if they can't handle it, what you have to remember, it's their problem, not yours. That's the important thing but they need to be told it's not appropriate and that you don't appreciate it and it's about, it's crossing a boundary and they need to understand where the boundary is. So you don't hold back, you tell them that's not appropriate. Okay. So I, I just wanna acknowledge um, what you said in terms of it's incredibly difficult to be the first person in a group of an underrepresented, in an underrepresented group or the only person in the room, and that it, it definitely is harder to do all of that, to think that is the burden really on my shoulders to change this entire organization so that I can fit in. And I think that groups like this that are really looking at allies and advocates or how to become allies and advocates is this is the responsibility of everybody, that this is exactly the kind of thing that you're trying to help with. If you're in a, a position of privilege, this is what you should, and you want to be an ally, this is what you should be addressing. So I, I always try to think of, yes, um, 
I remember many, many times where I was the first woman in a department or the, first, the only woman um, in a conference or the only woman at, um, at the table. And I can talk about my experiences, uh, my firsthand experiences as a woman and, and, and ask for allies and advocates for women. But I also want to be an ally or an advocate to say women of color. And I don't obviously, since I'm white, I don't have that firsthand experience. I need to be listening to, to try to not charge, on, charge in on my high horse saying, I know what I can do for you. Rather, I need to listen to what you're telling me of, how, of ways that I can help. So allies and advocates are really important. It's the people of privilege, whatever privilege we have, and we all have some, trying to help everyone and, and, and trying to get out of our comfort zones, move away from our stereotypes to try and help everybody. Thank you. Hi, uh, Scott Gowdy, Ohio State University. Um, uh, first, I just want to say thank you. I think it's amazing that we're having this panel here. Um, I want to actually, um, I want to ask the moderator if it's okay that I make a small advertisement. It's relevant, I promise. Bart sure. Leaves. Um, I don't know if this was said already, but there is the second inclusive astronomy conference uh, is coming up. Uh, it is October, let me see if I get this right, 14th and 15th at Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm on the SOC, which is why I'm Advertising this, Lou Strogler at STSCI is the SOC chair, so I encourage you um, to think about uh, to, trying to attend that conference if you can. I mention this because I'm an astronomer, not an astrobiologist, despite what Sean Donald Goldman always says. Um, I do have a question, though, um, and, and I also wanted to thank you for bringing up the, 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 the uh, issue about, um, about domestic abuse. I myself was a, a, a victim of, of domestic abuse, and I think it's something that... Um, we feel like, as, uh, as scientists, that well, we cannot bring these kinds of things into, uh, into our professional lives. We should hide them um, when, in fact, they do affect our ability to accomplish our, our jobs, and it, it affected mine. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, my question is about the, um, something that I just learned very recently, and I'm ashamed to say that I just recently learned about it, neurodiversity. Um, and I myself uh, have a mild case of Asperger's syndrome, and so I have a tendency to not notice uh, nonverbal cues. As a result, I tend to talk over people, not intentionally, but just because I don't realize they're done speaking. Um, and I have, this has been interpreted by some subset of people as being hostile to certain underrepresented or uh, groups because of, uh, of the fact that I am talk over people, even though I try really hard not to. Um, so, so this is a question of where two different kinds of diversity, right, and uh, we want to include both, but it's not, but sometimes one can be misinterpreted as being uh, bigoted or hostile or whatever, or prejudice when that's not, when it's really just someone manifesting their neurodiversity. And similarly, the, it, the you could misinterpret it from the other side as well. So how do we how do we deal with these, these, as we start dealing with more and more kinds of diversity, how do we deal with these kinds of conflict? It's a great question. So as it turns out, my husband has Asperger's. <laughs> so I deal with this on a daily basis as well. And I think, I think how we deal with that, especially like neurodiversity, is I just think that we, um, uh, for those of us who maybe <clears throat> You know, for those of us that have some privilege or don't have to deal with those things, I think we have to learn to be comfortable in understanding that that diversity exists so that we create a safe space for those of us who have these diversities, LGBTQ, neurodiversity can communicate that diversity so that we can create understanding, so that we can create, you know, a safe space of understanding. Um, one of the things I encourage my husband to do is to communicate to people. He doesn't necessarily have to say, hey, I have Asperger's. He can just say, you know, um, <clears throat> I don't always get social cues. Can you, I sometimes will over talk and I won't get a social cue, so can you be a little bit more direct with me in his workplace? So um, I think that um, there, there are strategies that we can do to kind of help communicate 
and help and foster understanding, but that takes the other side being receptive, and that's where we really have to work on people being receptive and open to differences. And I think that's the big thing that we have to work on heavily. Don't die on us, Kenda. I need you for another like 20 minutes. <laughs> So, um, so I have a secret. It was a secret for the first 55 years of my life, and no one knew about it except my closest friends, and that was that I am dyslexic. And around a number of years ago, I started telling people in my, in my peer group, in my, on my teams, um, uh, in my leadership, um, coalition that I had this disability and it was extremely um, difficult for me to do certain aspects of my job and I was amazed at how supportive people were when I finally <coughs> let people know uh, about this so I for, for, for the past year, I've been doing science and public outreach. I am responsible for things like um, editing a newsletter, writing press releases, all sorts of things that involve writing that are, I'm a, I'm a pretty good writer, but I'm a terrible, I am the world's worst copy editor. So I asked my team members to step up and, because I said, uh, my eyes can never be the last set that see this document. And it was amazing how supportive they were and receptive they were. They didn't put me in a box um, where I had always thought of this as a weakness, and it turned out that it strengthened our team for them to know about this and for, for them to be able to do components of the job that I could not myself do. So telling a group of people um, that you have this particular Asperger's dyslexia, whatever it might be, it is surprising to me and amazing how supportive um, people can be in that sort of circumstance. I just wanted to say real quick that um, as someone who has ADHD, I totally feel you on the missing social cues, talking over people without realizing it thing. What's worked for me, and honestly I think this can be applied to a lot of the topics we're talking about when things are being brought up, is to, as hard as it is, avoid the temptation to go on the defensive. You know, and I think as long as you're making, you know, a good faith effort and you're not going to be perfect, no one here is, I think that can really get you pretty far. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joy. I'm at the Carnegie Institute for Science in Washington, D.C. I want to thank you all for sharing your stories. It's very important to hear from diverse perspectives. Um, and in the spirit of Pride Month, and Lauren, you shared you're a bisexual. I've never came out professionally before, but I, too, am a bisexual. Um, you don't have to clap for me, it's not a big deal. Um, <laughs> but um, I do have a question. So Joan, you shared your story of your uh, sexual harasser only receiving administratively a slap on the wrist. So maybe it falls on us to professionally and academically punish them, maybe. Um, so my question is, should we do that? Should we stop sending our students to those perpetrators' labs? Should we stop citing their work? What if it's really important work? Should we divorce the product that they produce from the person? Um, I'd love to hear your perspectives. Great question. So many good questions. <laughs> so I, I should clarify that the, 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 and any of the, um, the people in the recent um, press have, were not my sexual harassers. So I was definitely working um, behind the scenes. And as part of um, that work, trying to figure out what to do before you know, any of the Title IX complaints were filed, was you know, what do you do as a professional who knows about this, and, but everybody's like pretending they don't know. And 
One of the, I, so I, I was a blogger at the time. I blogged for a long time for, for women in astronomy. And one of the things um, I wrote about was a call to shun, question mark, um, that, you know, we all just, so this person shows up at our meetings, do we all just turn away from him? So that was a, a possibility that, that people had raised. Um, at, at the same time, I was working at the National Science Foundation as a rotator. And I asked all of my colleagues who knew about this particular individual, say, what do you do? What do we do if this person submits a proposal? Some of the people on the review panel know about the, the history. Some of them don't. How do we deal with it if, that, if this issue comes up? Do we? And at the time, they said, you just have to stop. This is not part of the proposal. Um, this can't be addressed which was very, very discouraging and unsatisfying. But now the NSF has a new policy. So um, it's, a, and it's like, I like to think it stemmed from, from, from that. I don't know if it did, but it certainly was true that I would talk to anyone in the building who would listen to me about this kind of issue. So I, I think um, if it's, it's also the other thing that's not part of this little talk that we gave today, but is part of my bigger sexual harassment talk, I finally had to add a slide on why women, especially women, don't report. And it's like there's so many incredibly good reasons because people that have never been there don't really have a feel. Why don't you just report? It'll just be out in the open. Everybody will know about it and then we can do something about it. And there's so many good reasons. And I think that there's even more reasons now. So if anyone comes to me for advice, my first, um, the first thing I say is, is not go and report. It's like we need to understand the situation first. Anybody else? No? You want to say something, um, I just want to echo what was just said. I mean, even this week in the media, you see why women don't report, right? <laughs> um, with the, the latest rape accusations against Trump. Um, and just they're completely getting kind of dismissed by and large, and, and she's asking, should I have even bothered? Gosh, I'm getting harassed in this interview. Should I have even bothered? Um, what, what has seemed to be the most successful lately is telling BuzzFeed anonymously, or telling <laughs> someone who knows the editor at BuzzFeed, and we'll pass it along to BuzzFeed. That's how a prominent member of um, a community who gave a keynote at this conference two years ago was taken away by and large, okay, was BuzzFeed. So that's all I'm gonna say. But then there were some, but the way it was done, right, was very brave uh, people in the community were willing to, uh, women were willing to speak up uh, publicly in that article, right? And I don't know if I would have had the courage, so that's a tough one, yeah. So um, I know a reporter who happens to work for BuzzFeed. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, she is someone that I would trust with anything, including my deepest, darkest secrets. So um, she's, the, she's the one that broke the case that, um, that I spoke about. There were four original complainants. She talked to all of them. Two of them wanted to remain anonymous. As far as I know, those names have never gotten out. So she was the, the and she's continued um, on, this for, for, on this issue for quite some time. But she is one of those reporters that I would trust with any secret that I had. I'll, I'll just say, I know I'm moderating and not on the panel, but I think that a lot of this comes down to your own personal comfort. If it were me and I knew that someone in a department was an abuser and that those higher up in the chain were not doing anything about it, then I would avoid working with them at all costs. I would not send a student to them to work with them. Um, I, I think that a lot of it does have to come down to you know, personal choices and personal responsibility, and you have to decide at what level you're, you're willing to do something or commit to taking this person out of action. If, if not through uh, higher ups, then just socially. I was just going to add one more point because it reminded me when you said that, that we used to have something, um, we still call it the whisper network, yeah. that, um, the, that 
word about particular sexual harassers, serial harassers, would get around via whispers in the back room. Um, and I had never heard the whisper network phrase expressed outside of the whisper network. And recently I've heard it more and more. So it's like the whisper network is becoming more of a thing that people know about. So that's at least um, the one way that department members used to try and steer um, a away potential targets for the harasser. On the other side, when I'm mentoring a student that's looking at going places where I know of somebody that has at least had a rumor to be a problem that's not public, I, I won't tell the student, don't go there. I will tell the student, this is what is out there, and this, was what, this is what I've heard, and this is what I believe to be true, so that way the student knows it. Because otherwise, you set up the potential for, like, I actually steer the guys away from the same people, but you, if, you, if, you, if you just tell the women, don't go work with this famous person, right. you, you set up a potential where you know, the, the guys get to go work with him mm. and the women don't. And that, that also can have an impact. So what I tend to do is if I feel like there's th that someone could be at risk, I make sure they know, so at least they're going in eyes wide open, like that, that, that's an issue there. I mean, I let them, them make that decision for themselves if they feel safe. Um, and okay, one addition, more, and then we'll move. Sorry, okay, move on to that. That's okay. In addition to that, I I also um, as I've had this experience on the other um, in other areas, not necessarily sexual, but like um, racial discrimination. I also, in, in addition to not telling that person don't go there, but in giving them eyes wide open, also I point them towards resources. If you yeah. do this, if you choose to do this, and you have a problem, yeah. here's A, B, C that can be your advocate. Here is another resource. I try to point them in resources so that they are not only eyes wide open, but armed to help themselves and protect themselves if something happens. Very good point. Yeah. Um, there's another A word that I thought about when I was putting together this panel. No, not that one. Um, I was thinking that one too, I guess. <laughs> uh, and that's accomplice. <laughs> I, was, I kind of shrunk away from that because I was like, I don't want people to get the wrong idea. but. Yeah, you, in addition to being an ally, in addition to being an advocate, you have to be someone's, someone's partner um, in this and, and on their side. So. <laughs> Thank you everybody for doing this. I really am appreciating that this is happening. I'm Hillary Hartnett, I'm at Arizona State University and I find, what did you teach your I did. I'm finding as I get further along in my career that I am beginning to be obsessed about institutions and institutional issues. And I think it's really important as we talk about inclusivity to recognize that there are fundamental equity problems in many institutions that prevent us from maintaining an inclusive environment that are beyond some of our controls, mm -hmm. right? And so I guess my question is to the more senior people on the panel, which is how do we really enact the institutional change. And I'll, I'll choose a sort of classical example that women and minorities are underpaid, at least say within the academy relative to their male colleagues, right? It's sort of a classic example, but it is probably one of the deepest barriers to an inclusive community at say the faculty level that we have. And that is something that we don't talk about very well. Well, one thing that jumps to mind right away um, in terms of another aspect on the pay, pay scheme is, um, is reimbursements uh, for students. In, it, can we start fronting the money for the travel instead right. of yes. Yes, reimbursing? Yes, please. please. <laughs> so that would be one clear thing. And getting rid of the GREs. So those are yes. two things that you can <laughs> do right away. <laughs> I think in, in terms of setting up inclusive environments in places where they aren't at all inclusive, um, like, like the branch that I'm managing right now, or at least aren't diverse uh, and are working and making them more inclusive, is, is encouraging the individuals that you think can be leaders within that institution to get the training they need to help lead um, other people. Um, so that way they can, the, the people that, that if, you, if you train them to be better, um, they'll have a larger effect than just one person. Also, um, um, for different universities, and I know that this, you know, there's probably only so much you can do here, but 
for supporting those diverse programs, the women and the women programs and the minority programs, advocating for high level people of power to be put in those positions. For example, um, most diversity programs they have, um, like um, I was an engineer, um, minority engineering programs, they have a director of engineering programs. At my alma mater, that director of that program was a dean and that dean had power. And so we had a very successful program because he had power to make things happen. And so advocating for people of power to be in that position, you know, to be, to be heading those programs to make sure that they are successful would really help. So it's going back to the pay scale thing. There's um, a couple of different things that come to mind. Um, the, the first one is that the more transparent we are, the, the more equal the pay scales are. So state universities have almost an easier time of having e uh, uh, an equal pay scale than private universities because we never know what it is. But the other thing is the entry level aspect when people come in to a position and negotiate, bargain, um, advocate for their own uh, salary and benefits. And this is definitely one of the aspects that, that keeps the, the gender pay scale unequal because men seem to bargain as a natural part of their job um, application and women don't. It's, so a, a number of years ago, I had to learn how to bargain as a, as a senior woman um, in astronomy. And boy, was it ever intimidating. Because when you push back on your original offer, you're, you're thinking, well, how much should I push? How, much will, how, how aggressive will I be? Um, and women are thought of as aggressive, and men are thought of as assertive. And there's this stereotypical double, double standard. So women, that doesn't conform to women's stereotype, but it is for men. So if men come in to, say, an assistant professor position, they're starting out at a higher salary because they bargained. And women are like, oh, yeah, that sounds like, good, that sounds like a good salary to me. And they're immediately, from the very, from the very um, uh, uh, entry levels of academia, already working on working at lower pay and somehow either we have to all be able to bargain equally which kind of defeats the purpose or we have to like eliminate bargaining from from this and it's um, it just it, it, it's like uh, so this whole thing about bargaining um, creates this unequal pay scale because men and women look at it differently and the most important thing is they're perceived differently when they do it Um, before we take the next question, I just want to let everyone know that on the schedule, this uh, panel officially ends at 6.30, and that is to allow people time to get to the public lecture if they want to go. However, if you don't plan to go to the public lecture, I am happy to keep taking questions as long as the panel is happy to do so, because there have been so many good questions, and this discussion is so good. So just letting people know if you plan to go to the public lecture and you need time to get there, now's the time. Sanjoy, come on down. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Sanjoy Som. I'm a research scientist at Blue Marble Space. <clears throat> so I'm a mixed race baby. Uh, the race I express genetically is a principal component of my racial identity. And so um, I, the person's race is not identified on a CV or a picture. Uh, you need to know somebody and not just see somebody to uh, really get a sense of who they are. So uh, those of you who make diversity and inclusion decisions based on CVs and pictures only, I urge caution. Um, humans are complicated. So, Thank you, that's a very good point. Uh, hello, my name is Colby Osberg. I'm a first year PhD student at UC Riverside and uh, clearly I'm quite pasty. But uh, I have grown up around color my entire life, and I find it super enlightening to be around a variety of cultures. 
Uh, but ever since I have stepped into the STEM field, I've noticed a uh, very uh, distinct lack of diversity of color. I was in the physics department at San Francisco State University, a generally diverse city, but yet there was only one black woman in the uh, physics department. And um, as a white man, you know, I have never had a problem with not being included, but I can only imagine, you know, what it's like for someone like her. And I think the most striking experience I had was uh, at LPSC in Houston, was very recently. Uh, they have a huge poster room in there because it's a very big conference and it's just a big sea of white old men. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> for me, it is also uncomfortable just, you know, being surrounded by no color. And I think the part that hurt me the most was it's a bunch of white men talking about science and then all the people working at the hotel are uh, mainly Mexican. And seeing that uh, difference really bothered me and hurt me. And so uh, I was just wondering what you guys, I mean, obviously I know your opinion on it, but more so like what you think the problem is, because it's not a problem in, you know, difference in intelligence. It's a problem with something that has to do like with early education and not getting excited about science or something like that. So I was wondering what you guys think the problem is and what the solution would be. So you're right, it's not, about, it's not about intelligence, it's not about an interest in science, it's about what we talked about earlier, that inclusivity and that acceptance and understanding that other person's world. So what, a lot of hap what happens to a lot of minority men and women when we get into the upper echelon of education, where we start to become the only one or fewer and fewer, is that because um, the, the groups that we're in don't always make, create inclusive environments and the departments that we're in don't always create inclusive environments and some of the universities don't always create inclusive environments, we start to feel isolated. And isolation in academia is a death sentence for your career. And it's, it's a, it, it, that is probably one of the biggest problems why you have a lot of, uh, and especially women of color exit academia, because if, if I'm going to feel like this, I might as well go out in the industry and make a lot of money, you know, <laughs> if I'm going to have to build up with this kind of isolation. So I think that is the crux of the problem, is that we need to create that inclusive environment. And it can start with you going up and including that black student and talking to her and creating a space where she feels included and welcome and comfortable. Now, you're not going to understand her experience. You're not going to talk to, be able to talk to her about being a black girl and in physics and, you know, her issues trying to find like a hairdresser in this new town and all that kind of stuff. You're just not going to be able to do that. But you can let her know and feel that she is welcome and that she is valued for who she is and what she brings and her intelligence and what she's going to contribute as a member of your group, your department and your university. Liz Miller, University of Washington. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to <laughs> kind of what you might do in a situation where you either witness or are the victim of harassment or a microaggression. Um, if you're someone who really doesn't have a lot of power, for example, if you're a grad student, and mm. especially if the person is someone whose work you really respect, someone you feel like you want to make a good impression on, um, and you know because you want to be able to stand up no matter what, but sometimes, you know, you really care about the science, and this is someone who's really important in your field, and and if you just don't have a lot of power, kind of how you deal with that situation. <laughs> so um, I'll I'll start and say that um, one of the one of, the, one of the ways you can do it is to reach out to an ally or an advocate who has more power. If you feel powerless, get somebody else to use their privilege to help you. So that's one way to do it. So I'll, I, I think there's lots of other answers, but I don't know pass the mic. Um, Kenny, you want to go first? Uh, I, 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 I was going to say the exact same thing. Yeah, you find you find somebody who has privilege and power, especially if there was witnesses to it, and you have them address it with that person and and take them on, and that's that is definitely a path to get things resolved. That, I've I've done that multiple times throughout my education, and it is 
it is pretty much the, the main way to get those kind of problems resolved. I, I, having been in a number of situations where I, it has been clear to me and not clear to a person at the table that they were uh, making what I thought a major microaggression on someone else, um, checking in with the person that you felt the microaggression was against after the fact um, can make a big difference. Because you know, having them see that someone else saw what they saw in that room um, can be really validating and helpful to them after the fact. Um, and, and in the meantime, do what you can within what you feel safe and comfortable doing in that, in that environment. Because if, the, if there's a power dynamic where you don't have the power, you know, don't put yourself at too much risk either. As a fellow grad student, I fortunately haven't had to deal with this particular problem, at least in a major way. But the philosophy I've been kind of adhering to is that no one in any field is so important that it's worth working with toxicity. <laughs> Nobody's that smart. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I'll say a lot of times we don't have the right response on the, in the spur of the moment. Sometimes we just really need to go back, take our time, work behind the scenes, recruit allies, and figure out what we're gonna, how we're gonna you know, fight the next fight how we're going to use our, our allies, this, um, this network that we're trying to form, um, to, to our best advantage in the next situation. So sometimes it's just like retreat so we can advance further. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. So I wanted to bring up something that makes <laughs> me very sad. We had intended to um, release a survey this week. We were supposed to launch it on Sunday. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> so long sigh. So thank you to Arsev. Where's Arsev? Arsev Idinalu, who is our astrobiology social scientist who does all the cool things and gives us numbers. He's created a fabulous survey, which we piloted. Thank you to Mary Wojtek, who's been supportive of all of this so that we can actually get some baseline demographics on our community mm -hmm. and so that we can find out what barriers are out there or you know, who is, you know, we can find out what the issues are for people in their, in their careers. However, bureaucracy has gotten in the way, but in the next six to nine months, we hope to get this survey out. We, we thought we'd gotten through everything, but there was one more to get through. Um, so I'm really hoping when we release it, we'll try and blast it out. If anybody has any ideas of places to blast it, and then when you do get it, please make sure that all of your colleagues, those who have continued in the field and those who left, please make sure that they get their hands on this mm -hmm. so that we can hear you know, the, the good things and the bad things. And we know there's going to be a lot of both, but we, we have to start somewhere and we don't have the numbers to start out with. So this will be... You know, this will be, I think, really helpful going forward. Can I bring up one question, one quick question? And it's, it's for Sean. As, as a really good father <laughs> who has turned down going to conferences, if you, you know, if your wife wasn't available to take, you know, you both share, you're both parent, has this impacted your career? I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I mean, I, I, there are definitely times I've turned down opportunities because my wife has to travel. And, and I, this, I don't, I'm not saying this because I'm up in this room in this particular space. Like, I say this privately. Like, I have a, the more fun job, but it's very clear to me that my wife has the most important job of the two of us. So, you know, if she's traveling or I'm traveling, like, I will always make space for her because I think what she's doing is way more important. She, she's working on uh, getting better vote, voter turnout in college campuses across the country. Um, so uh, in some sense, I don't care <laughs> because even if it is impacting my career, A, I've got a lot of other privilege I can lean on, right? And this is the, by the way, this is the other thing that those of you with privilege can do is use it not just in the workplace, but at home, okay, right? Like if I can use my privilege in the workplace to um, get by not making that trip um, and, and it lets my wife make the trip that she might need to make, um, I'm going to do that. So I, I don't know, but I don't care if it did. I, I would just like to point out that you know Sean is very comfortable in his masculinity because he agreed to join the red lipstick panel, which we have here. Yep. So props to you for that. And I would be remiss not to thank my own husband who is here with our baby. 
Um, I would not be standing here right now if he had not agreed to make this trip with me and help me watch Eleanor this week. So thank you so much, Keith. I love you so much. <laughs> Come on forward. Ask your question. <laughs> Hi, uh, Ulysse Pedrera. Uh, I did my PhD in Lyon in France, and I'm currently a postdoc at RPI in uh, Troy, New York. Uh, first, thank you very much for doing that. Um, that's something uh, I had a glimpse of that when I was at Goldschmidt uh, last year, where there was a plenary talk about inclusivity and gender equality. And all of a sudden, I realized that the room changed completely in terms of demographics, and that struck me at that point. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I guess some of my questions were already answered before, and the, the actual point I wanted to talk about was the fact that when you're a grad student, you're very weak in your position. And um, when you know, and so becoming an ally or an advocate, when you know that someone is behaving a certain way, um, it is very confusing, uh, first, because you notice a lot of harassment and abuse, not only sexual harassment or gender inequalities in general, but also just in the way that there is a hierarchy in research that is not talked about. We tend to think of our relationships with our supervisors are, uh, as being very horizontal, but they are not. And you realize that generally when it's too late. Um, so, yes, I think uh, my question goes with what was asked before, is when you notice these kind of abusive behaviors, what do you do when you are in this very weak position of being a uh, graduate student at that point? And should we, how, how can we start the conversation in the community to change the, the, the actual values we have and the characteristic we values for people of not being as, um, ready to bargain about positions and not being ready to talk very loudly about um, thoughts that we have and attack students of other people during conferences because we do not agree with their supervisors, etc., etc. So how do we change all of that so that we become more inclusive to everyone and we stop having these high risks of mental health issues for graduate students that are really more prevalent than in other groups of the same ages? Mm -hmm. It's a big question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that goes along with creating this in more inclusive environment and for all of us to now go out and to, and especially those of us with more, you know, um, you know, privilege or power or whatever, um, to really take responsibility you know uh, it is it is really on our shoulders so i feel it you know i need to feel it on my shoulders now especially that i need to be really keeping an eye out and um i think uh we could do a better job uh encouraging each other as faculty and really remembering we're not <laughs> you know once we're tenured we have to do an even better job now from now on um and uh, so that then when the students have an issue, um, it's also very important that they know who uh, the kind of aspiring allies and advocates who have uh, really been trying to educate, like the people in this room who are really you know, all trying to educate um, themselves and each other um, are, because it can be very isolating, as, as many of you know, in those communities where you don't know, like, can I tell this person or is it going to backfire and they're just going to go tell, you know, my supervisor right away or, you know, and so um, creating those safe kind of network spaces so that we, we know who a safe person to tell who is not just going to go blab, you know, and get us in bigger trouble. Um, and so I think it's really nice that that's happening right here so that you look around and, and uh, you know, these are the people that you can start to kind of rely on to protect each other. <laughs> well, I, I was just, um, I was just thinking back on some of the challenges I have, and I, I guess I took some big risks because I was pretty tenacious. I just threatened lawyers, and <laughs> things got fixed. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. Get them. <laughs> so um, long, long ago, I was an undergraduate at RPI, um, and at that time, they did not, as far as I know, 
have uh, any sort of student or postdoc committee on diversity and inclusion. And they, ha as far as I, they have never invited me back to, to give a talk, but other engineering universities have, like Caltech. So I've been to Caltech three times to talk about diversity and inclusion to bigger and bigger, um, bit bigger audiences. And one thing I found out on my last visit is they have a very active um, graduate student and post, um, postdoc group on diversity and inclusion at Caltech. And they were interested in how to acquire more power. And one of the ideas that I had is that each of them pick a, a professor from somewhere across campus. So usually someone with tenure, someone who could be senior, has a lot of privilege. Because there are professors somewhere, you can't always identify them right away, but if you're there for long enough, you can, who are interested in becoming allies and advocates. And bring those people into the group and show them or teach them what they need to do to help. And they have privilege, they don't necessarily know what to do with it or how to help, but the, the graduate students know exactly what they need to do to help. <laughs> so combining or getting these people together, the, the senior um, pr full professors you know, with tenure um, who have privilege but want to do better, and the graduate students who, who know how to make them better, getting those two groups of people together seemed to be a really powerful combination. So try doing that at RPI. OK, let's make these the last three questions for the evening. Uh, hi, I'm Annalise. I'm from the University of Victoria. Uh, this is kind of an another question on the inclusivity front. Uh, so mental health issues disproportionately affect uh, LGBTQ plus and minority groups. and their general, the mental health resources on university campuses for both students and staff are generally considered to be fairly useless. Um, what do you think the best way we can leverage our positions as students or as faculty to increase access and utility of those resources? Okay, okay first off, um, and this is more of a general thing and eventually could turn into a tangent about unionization and everything, but I know something that would help me a lot because I have similar issues that I basically had to go off campus for mental health care for counseling and it's not covered by my, the graduate student insurance as a result, um, is increasing what is covered by the university health plan in whatever form that is to actually encompass a, the much wider swath of the mental health professional community than, you know, whatever little bit you can get on campus. Yeah. Oh. Well, for faculty, we can just um, uh, either attend our faculty senate meetings and make a fuss, which all of us have the ability to do, or just write our president lots of emails, which is what I did. And it uh, actually, it's amazing how quickly they can just change things um, overnight. We had a limit on the number of mental health um, visits per, per, I think it was per their entire graduate program. And they just did away with that. We had a horrible um, event, um, tragedy happen. And, um, you know, enough emails to the president, and bam, it's changed. And so um, we can all speak out like that, especially those of us with, um, you know, the faculty. Yeah. Uh, and, and I would agree with that. And I would also say, like, and just to model Georgia Tech, which I think has um, done some great things, also looking at, you know, really extending things like employee assistant programs that are access to the faculty, extending that to your postdocs. Like, pushing to extend that to your postdocs and to your graduate students, and, and maybe even some limited access for undergrads, too, so they, they have that resource to go out and find a counselor, not necessarily the on-campus counselors, which, yes, usually tend to be useless, but they can go out and use their medical benefits to go out and find a counselor and get a few free sessions to help with the crisis and then kind of choose their care from on there. So I, that, that, that's been a great benefit at Georgia Tech, was that, that it was extended to, this, to the postdocs and the grad students, and I, it, I think that's a good model that other universities could follow. 
in the, the, the thing on the more local and immediate level as a mentor or as a manager is we need to stop stigmatizing mental health and, and start appreciating it as something that is real, that is especially uh, uh, a big problem in our field, and that it's no, it's no different from being sick. And you need to make space for it in your departments, in your research groups. You just, you need, and we need to reduce the mental, the, the overall stress that's leading to that in the first place as well, where we can. Like, Slack is a great tool, but it also leads to a lot of after hours and weekend work, and it can cause uh, uh, additional stress as well. So that we just need to be mindful of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll say as someone who's now been sober for almost three years that, um, uh, that alcohol is a big problem here too, and um, don't and and so if we can promote kind of um, alternatives to alcohol, those of us that previously or now are struggling with that can it's a lot easier. So, and those of us who are on anxiety meds and can't drink, <laughs> <That too>. yeah. <laughs> okay, next question. Hi, um, thanks for this panel, it's been really great. Um, I'm Matilda Newton from University of Colorado, and I wondered if you could address um, the fact that most of our professional and scientific environments are designed for men. Um, I'm freezing, I've been freezing all right? week and, <laughs> and every day for the four summers that I have lived in this country. Um, my lab coats are boxy and the arms are too long, my pipette, uh, Plunges are too high for my tiny lady hands, and my beakers are, are too large for me to hold with one hand where my, my male colleagues can do so easily. And there's so many things that we consider the default in these settings, and actually they're, they're not. They shouldn't be default, and they're not, they're not suited for everyone equally. Can you talk to that, please? Yeah, I think... Uh, safety is also a huge issue related to that, and a study just came out about that. And safety in the workplace for women and, and how women are not included in these studies for safety. So I have a lot of feelings about this topic <laughs> um, because, you know, while some of it hasn't changed, it turns out completely over, overhauling your hormonal makeup causes a lot of stuff to be different than it used to be. And then, yeah, all of a sudden, why is the room so much colder than it used to be? And it's like, oh, okay, well, my skin is literally thinner now, so now I lose heat more easily. Um, and I think a lot of it is just one of those things where you really have to hammer it on the powers that be repeatedly until it gets into their head that it's a real thing. Because since they literally can't physically experience it, it's out of sight, out of mind. So th that has been my approach so far, anyways. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please. Squeaky wheel gets the email. Everyone yeah. got the email, right? That said like it, yeah, that this is a cold room. Them. Yeah. <laughs> it's still freezing in here. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually a study um, that just came out recently about productivity and room temperature between men and women, and it's kind of funny because when the room is colder, men are more productive. When the room is warmer, women are more productive. So there's this dichotomy that we have to manage. So I, I just want to give men a and quick, women work in separate rooms. <laughs> I want to give a, a quick shout out to Jada Arney, who, when she got the email from the hotel saying we have a cold hotel, emailed that study to the hotel. <laughs> Still, that's, I salute you. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's a, what? Oh. It's, it's, um, it's not a coincidence that I'm wearing a long sleeve leather jacket to, to come to a conference, right? Um, so, um, so part of it is like, why is this type thing? You know, why do we have beakers you can't hold? And it, it actually stems from, you know, academia comes from the, the monks in the, you know, the, 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 the monasteries. <coughs> and, you know, all the things that we think of, like from beakers that we can't hold to um, schedules that no human being contemplating a, a work-life balance mm -hmm. would ever keep, <laughs> all stem back to the monks in the monastery. It's like we're trying to change hundreds of years of culture 
because that's what, that, that's what academia grew from. And it's even worse than that, because all of this, everything that we're talking about, all these double standards, are a result of that we, all of us, have, <coughs> sorry, um, all of us are, have been living um, in a system of patriarchy for not only our entire lives, but for over 10,000 years. Like, almost everyone you've ever known or could ever name in history lived under patriarchy. And we think about why is this the normal? And it's like, it's not always been the normal, it's just been the normal, oh, thank you. It's, like, it's just been the normal for the past 10,000 years. And so we're trying to change hundreds of years since the monasteries and 10,000 and 10, years since the patriarchy. And no wonder it's not easy, but um, I, I would say, just to, to end on a note of optimism, I have been in science and astronomy for not hundreds of years and not 10,000 years, but for, for multiple decades. And all I can say is it's getting better. It's, it's so significantly better. We have so much work still to do, but it does improve and that's the kind of thing that keeps me going. We got this. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Georgia. I'm from the University of New South Wales in Australia. And so the GSA, the Geological Society of Australia, has been given students at universities for the past uh, few years money and support to run a student um, geoscience or earth science conference. And I'm part of the committee and so is Bonnie back there. And what we really wanted to do this year with this conference was try to make it as inclusive as we could. And so back at uni we've gone to all the EDI people on campus to talk to them about it, but since we're here at the conference, we thought we'd ask the panel what your experience have, uh, what your experiences with inclusivity at conference has been. Like, what's made it a good experience? What's made it a bad experience? And also, students, everyone who's a student here specifically, like, what's made it easier for you to go to conferences, and what's made it harder for you? Because it is a student conference. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. I just want to um, give a sh uh, kind of a shout out to a resource for this, which is the 500 Women Scientists Guide to Inclusive Conferences, and that has just like tons of, of resources about, there's so many things, right, that we can do. And so um, check that out, if, just Google 500 Women Science Inclusive Conference. And, and then also in there, they have like but a bunch of more resources about like accessibility and the, and the pronouns and all these different things you can, you can do and things that I never thought of. That. Um, yeah, I would just say like, um, you know, you have an opportunity since you're running a student conference to set the standard and expectation and set your policies for what is acceptable and what is not to create a safe space for people to feel comfortable coming to the meeting and be upfront and be direct right on the website, right as people register that this is our policy. And those that cannot follow that or abuse it will be asked to leave, you know, just to set your standards now. And uh, one more thing is, um, it's easy to kind of say, have a code of conduct, right? And then, um, you see something, say something, but like to whom? And will those people be trustworthy? And what um, evidence is there? What trainings have they had? Like, you don't, you know, you're not gonna wanna go tell somebody who you don't trust. And so you really need to establish as part of the inclusivity, you know, um, make sure if you're gonna have a code of conduct, which hopefully you do, then you also need to put the time in to find those people and have them wear some kind of button or something and have them be trained and trustworthy and then have their, like, what are you going to do if there is an incident? Then those, you know, so it's a lot. Organizing is, uh, an inclusive conference is a lot more work, right? Um, but we, we need to strive for that. Um, so one of the things that's made that I've found has made going to conferences easier for me is that we don't have all male panels, uh, especially when they're talking about women's issues. Um, Sean's uh, our token male today. <laughs> the, the, um, 
The, the Committee on the Status of Women in Astronomy, a number of, uh, not that long ago, decided that they would uh, publish uh, a list of conferences, astronomy conferences, from across the world, and we would identify what number of, uh, of plenary speakers were men and women. So it's, we weren't pointing fingers, we were just publishing their numbers. And it was amazing how much attention that list got when a panel or a, a, a conference came up where the, all of the, the plenary speakers were men. And just drawing attention to, to something like that um, seemed to make a big difference. And it's like, we're not blaming you. I mean, you invited the speakers. We're just publishing a list type thing. <laughs> And someone mentioned um, earlier that a lot of our most, our diverse, our most diverse population in science is the youngest. So a lot of our students are much more diverse than our senior faculty. So another thing that we did is we, in, this was specifically in astronomy, we went through every astronomy PhD granting department in the country, and we looked at how, what, what is, what's the number of women that have tenure, and what's the number of men that have tenure and we just published a list. And there was nobody who was mad at us except the department that had zero tenured women and all of their, their tenured faculty were, were men. And, but it, it said, it's not our fault you haven't hired anyone you know, who's, who's tenured who's a woman, we're just publishing a list. And somehow being confronted with their own numbers and everyone else, you know, all the other departments that were not doing great, but were at least doing better than they were, um, made them sit up and take notice. So sometimes um, things, it, it, as I said earlier, things do get better, but it takes way too much time. So. And I think that's a good segue to remind everyone of the QR code. So and. Feel free to steal that idea. It was actually Rose Jones, who's not able to be here, said, why don't you put up a QR code to the survey and you can ask people what they want to do at this workshop. And I was like, that's a very good idea. So um, you know, ask your community, what, what do you need at a conference? What have you not gotten at a conference that you would like to see? And I think that that's a very powerful tool is to just listen and you know, ask questions. So, oh, yes. Of course you can say something. <laughs> You're Mary. <laughs> I just want to thank you for having um, Sean, even with his lipstick, um, on the panel. He looks divine, doesn't because he? I, uh, <laughs> having been involved and on panels f since, you know, for the past 30 years to talk about um, uh, diversity and inclusiveness, I actually get very irritated when it's all women. And I think having a panel of all women with only women in the audience, it doesn't, isn't inclusive, in fact. It actually sets you apart in a way that um, I, does, I, I think doesn't help the, the issue. And so I want to thank all the men yes. who showed up. Thank you, white men. I, just, I have done this several times with AGU, and there have been two men in the audience. And so... Well, I'm, I'm proud of all of you. This <laughs> meeting is so amazing, and then there's more women presenting, and actually more men listening. It's really great. Yeah. <laughs> Props. To so all thank of you. you. Yes. Well, this has been an amazing discussion, and again, I want to thank all of you for sticking it out to the end and asking so many amazing questions and getting this dialogue going. I want to thank our panelists one more time. You guys are so good. Especially Sean and Joan, because neither of them had ever met me in person. And for all they knew, I was a complete psychopath, which could be true. <laughs> but thank, thank all of you for, for being here and for participating in this discussion. And um, one more time, there's the code. So please, you know, give us your thoughts. Um, and I want to thank Melissa and Mary for being so supportive of this event and you know, for taking this idea and letting me run with it. I couldn't have done this without you. And, and let's thank Lauren for organizing it. <laughs>